Welcome to the Authentic Life Connection Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Lusk. I'm a master certified life coach, author, personal trainer, and nutrition specialist. For over a decade, I've been helping people with their dreams and goals for their life and health. I spent many years watching people get frustrated with their journey in life and giving up on taking actions towards their goals. So I dug in deep to find answers to why so many of us face this same frustration and struggle in life. So in this podcast, we're going to dive in deep on topics surrounding what it means to consistently live a fulfilling and authentic life, where you are unstoppable in taking action towards your dreams and goals. So the only question is, are you ready to start living your most authentic and fulfilling life once and for all? Then let's get started, shall we? Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. For those of you listening in for the first time, welcome, welcome. You picked a really fascinating episode to join in on because this week I have a special guest joining me today. For the fourth time, I believe, on our podcast, it's Mike Iamelli. And if you guys remember a few episodes, we've done four episodes together, not the last episode we did together, but the one before that, we talked about sex. And today we're going to talk about sex again, but from a slightly different perspective. Today, what we're going to talk about is how we can begin releasing sexual shame surrounding our kinks, fetishes, turn-ons, why this is so important for the health of our intimate relationships with our partners in life, as well as our relationship with ourself, and how our kinks, fetishes, and turn-ons, when we really lean into them, and we open up to understanding where they're coming from, they're actually superpowers to understanding how we want to create our most authentic and fulfilling life. So stay tuned to this episode. You don't want to want to miss this conversation with me and Mike. All right, without any further ado, here is my call with Mike Iamelli on releasing sexual shame. All right, everyone. I've got Mike Iamelli here with me for the fourth time on our podcast here. So um, yeah, we just can't get enough of him on here. So we're having him on again today. We're going to talk about something um, similar to what we talked about two episodes ago when Mike was on, but this time we're going to focus on fetishes and kinks today because I feel like this is something that's important for us to be able to talk about in a normal context without people getting that feeling in the pit of their stomach, like they're talking about something they shouldn't be talking about. So I brought Mike on today because he works with a lot of people and being able to openly discuss this without it feeling like this dirty feeling and being able to really normalize and see what these are all about and see that our kinks and fetishes aren't coming from this sexually deviant, dirty place that a lot of us might feel like they are. So Mike, Thanks for coming back on again for the fourth time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me again. Why don't you give a quick introduction to everybody, those who haven't heard uh, about you on this podcast before, kind of what you do, who you are, and uh, we'll get started on this conversation. Sure. I love it. Yeah. So um, I'm Mike Iamelli, and basically what I do for work is I just help people to map their lives and figure out what they're most sensitive to. And that's going to tell us everything. That's going to tell us what you subconsciously do when you're successful, um, what you secretly crave in bed, if we're talking about that, like this conversation, um, what your sexual superpowers are, and really what you do differently than anyone. Because if you, the way you sense the world is going to tell us everything. You know, if you're sensitive to connection, you are going to be really, you know, sensitive to feeling left out or lonely or bored. You're going to have such a superpower for connecting with people, looking them in the eyes. You're going to love sex that has eye contact and holding hands. There's a lot of things we can predict about you and help put you in the position to make sure that you're more successful in life. Awesome. And guys, I, I follow Mike on Instagram. I've seen a lot of his work. I've had many conversations with him. And if this sounds like interesting work for you, um, I think you do workshops quite regularly for people to join in. And some of them I are do virtual. now just I've just started monthly ones. Yes, free okay. monthly workshops. So join. Yeah. So Mike has got you guys covered monthly workshops. You guys can join in and it's virtual, correct? Like they can join all in. virtual. Yep. Yep. So awesome. anyone in the world can join. So No excuses. It doesn't matter where in the world you are. You can join. in. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Mike, um, I've had you on, like I said, for the fourth time now, two episodes ago, we talked about kind of sexual liberation and yeah. we talked about the LGBTQA plus community and how yeah. Um, sexual liberation there is actually about sexual sexual liberation for everybody. And I wanted to bring you back on today to specifically 
talk about one particular side of sexual liberation. And what I mean by that is talking about our fetishes and kinks and where these come from, why we have them, and how we can sort of start approaching them in a way where it's not this feeling that a lot of us get that it, we're entering into this dirty sort of deviant territory about ourselves. Um, because you have a very, I feel like the way you approach this is very interesting. It's very um, intriguing. It's very academic. It's very informative. And it's also very honest and open. So I, I enjoy the way you approach talking about this topic in a way that makes it very normalized for people to kind of look at this without the shame. Yeah. Well, I think you just hit the nail on the head right there when you mentioned looking at it without the shame. You know, if we take a step back, what sexual liberation to me means is really just without shame. And I think that for a lot of us, we think sexual liberation means, you know, promiscuity, lots of partners, which it can be. You can do whatever you want, but it may not. It could be talking about sex all the time or not. I have no idea what liberation means to you. All liberation means is without shame. And so I am always in my work interested in going to where is the most shame. And we talk about the queer community. There's a lot of shame around sexuality because we've been shamed around our sexuality. And more specifically, like today's conversation, around kinks and fetishes, right? So that's where the most shame is. And that's where we can get the most liberation. And that's why we're going to start here today. And it is academic. You know, if we go, and I'm going to do a little talk about sensitivities for a moment to go here, because if we think, well... I'm going to give you a totally non-sexual example, actually, to help everyone get there. So the first time I really understood sensitivities, I was working in public relations and I went over to the receptionist and she was crying. And so I went over to her boyfriend and I said, hey, you know, she's crying. Can you just go check on her? And he said, I was just talking to her. She's not crying. And I said, no, no, there aren't tears streaming down her face, but there are tears in her eyes. She's crying. Go check on her. And he said, Mike, I'm looking at her right now. She's not crying. And it was the first moment I thought, oh, I literally sense the world differently than you. I sense vulnerability where you may not sense it. Mm -hmm. And that started a thought experiment for me of just maybe I interact with the world differently because I sense it differently. And if that's true, then, you know, if someone's sensitive to, you know, connection, like we talked about before, as a baby, they were probably really sensitive to their mom looking them in the eyes and having that attention. And as they grew up, they were really sensitive to feeling left out anytime or, you know, rejected. And these are the kids who grew up to always include everybody and they became community builders. And today they're the people in business I advise to have one-on-one calls because they're great at forming connection and making people feel safe. We can see a pattern throughout. And I started to realize if that's true, This is going to predict a whole bunch of things about life because whatever I'm sensitive to, I'm going to hone more of that skill because I'm going to be seeing it all the time and feeling it. I'm going to see nuances other people just don't see, and it's going to give me an increased feeling. You know, Mm -hmm. if we talk about sensitivities, what we're talking about is able to sense more. We literally experience more life there. It lights us up. You know, if I'm sensitive to vulnerability and I see a sad movie, I'm going to cry more than the average person or my husband. He's sensitive to proud. Never seen anyone like this. He loves watching the Olympics. He does not care who wins or loses, but when he sees people so proud of themselves, he starts tearing up. He just can't stop himself because he's sensitive to it. He feels it deeper than anybody. Obviously that translates over to sex, right? And I think we have this myth in sexuality that sex is about the physical acts. And I can promise you that is not true. You know, anyone listening here, if you've ever had a sexting conversation that hit all the right notes for you, we all know that can be way more erotic than a physical act. So it's about the emotional experience, right? The physical acts are getting us to an emotional experience, but it's about the emotional experience. And kinks and fetishes form around what we want to feel deepest, right? They're that deep catharsis. I mean, all of us have had sex that's been like, okay, we got off, big deal. And then we've had this deep catharsis that somehow felt on soul level. Like we felt cleansed. We felt something release within us. Mm -hmm. And kinks and fetishes, quite frankly, are just the way our mind has joined together conditioning and experience and trauma to heal ourselves according to what we're sensitive to. 
And so it's just giving us these outlets and it's very predictable. Before I shut off, I'm going to say one more thing because it is so predictable, it's shocking. I had a, uh, a two stories. I had a client once who's sensitive to scene. And I said, okay, so like voyeurism, exhibitionism are things that interest you. He's like, no, 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 they don't, Mike. It's like, oh, okay, that's fine. A week later, he came back to me and he said, Mike, my deepest shame is that growing up, I caught my neighbor changing one time. And I have thought about that over and over again. And I thought I'm dirty. I'm creepy. I'm effed up. I've wanted to play it out in fantasies with partners. And I thought something is wrong with me. And when you said that, you triggered me because it's like you could see my whole soul. These things are predictable. On the other side, I, I did a workshop, uh, a retreat about a month ago now, and we were doing this work and we dichotomized the praise and the shame around this. So I'm not going to go too deep into this because I know that sounds complex. But basically, if I look at, let's say, desired, I'm going to say, what are ways that I've been praised for being desired? Maybe it's dressing nice. What are ways I've been shamed for it? Maybe it's dressing slutty. So we're going to play with that. And a lot of our kinks and fetishes, we're going to find around the places we've been shamed. Those are the areas we haven't been able to express ourselves. We can do a whole exercise on that later. But anyway, one person, one of his desires that was shamed was being gang banged by seven guys. And we're sitting in this room and he's like, I don't know, you know, I feel so much shame saying that. And I said, well, I mean, what is more desired than seven people wanting you at month once? Duh. So here's how we're going to translate that to your monogamous relationship with your husband. And later on that day, he said, he called his husband. He said, oh my God, I have all these ideas. Our sex life is going to get so much better. Our intimacy is going to get so much better. And he said, I told everyone that I want to get gang banged by seven guys. And the husband said, um, that sounds like incredibly erotic. Did the room get super sexual? He's like, no, honey, it was a literal whiteboard. It was like being in school. And we were like, oh, that makes sense. That's logical. Obviously, gang bang would be a common fantasy for somebody who is sensitive to desired and so again these things are incredibly logical and when we understand them we can drop shame and we can do tons of games today to begin to help you understand them for yourself so i have a question for you sure do you believe that everyone has sexual fe uh, fetishes or kinks yes you know <laughs> Some of this is semantic, right? It's a little bit arbitrary because what we're talking about here is way, um, a symbolic or metaphorical ways of getting your sensitivities met. Now, every single one of us has it, right? Even if you have a, a romantic, you want to call it a romantic fantasy of somebody, you know, coming up to you and taking you out to a fancy dinner and coming home and making passionate, sweet love to you. That's a fantasy. It's on the same vein as any other stuff. But what we're calling kinks and fetishes is really anything that we perceive as deviant. Mm -hmm. It's the exact, they're just associations. They're symbolism to get our needs met. We think, oh my God, that would make me feel luxurious. Let's say that's your, fan your sensitivity. Maybe being taken to a fancy hotel, super luxurious. But also maybe somebody, I don't know, like, draping you in the most expensive clothing and then like ripping it off of you and having sex with you would also make you feel that they're all on the same spectrum so for a lot of us because i know a lot of us are going to listen and clutch our pearls and say no no mike i have no kinks i have no fetishes you know that's not me there's nothing weird or wrong about it it is simply a strategy our mind has made around our sensitivities now i want to add a nuance here because a lot of times what will happen is when we're growing up, especially our early sexual encounters, we will experience for the first time that sensitivity in a sexual way. What I mean by that is let's say that you are in the gym locker room and, you know, this hot, sweaty jock is taking off clothing and you see his jock strap and that lights up your powerful sensitivity. You may fetishize the jock strap as powerful because you've created a connection. But it's about what you feel underneath that. So we do have these moments in life that are going to condition us or bring in conditioning because our fantasies come from what we've seen out there, right? You can't, you know, we have some idea of these fantasies, but they're always tied back to your sensitivity. And I think a lot of times therapists, or at least my clients will hear from some therapists, hear from some coaches, you know, that's a trauma response or that's a response to this one situation and we need to get rid of it. 
And I'm not saying every fantasy and fetish out there is 100% healthy because we may have ones that, you know, are uh, a little bit more, um, quote unquote, um, disempowering, non-consensual. But what I always tell people is, number one, your fantasy, there's not necessarily indication that you're, you want to live out your fantasy in real life. And number two, it's actually symbolism for some emotion. Mm -hmm. If we can get down to the emotional aspect or the sensitivity aspect like we're talking about today, then there are a thousand ways to play it. And right. here is my tip for every partner out there. I Right now, if you're scared to talk to your partner about any kink, any fantasy, any fetish, here's what I want you to do. Very simple. Or if you, you've talked to your partner and they've rejected you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take it. Let's say being tied up is your fantasy and your partner's not comfortable or you're afraid to talk to your partner about that. I want you to simply ask yourself, what emotion do I think I hope to feel from this? Maybe it's playing with being freed and restrained. Maybe that's the emotion, right? Maybe through being tied up, I can be even more liberated and free. If that's the emotion, you're going to take that. I want you to brainstorm three simple ways that you can ask your partner for that. And I just want you to say this phrase. It's very easy. You know, I listened to this crazy guy, Mike, today, and he made me realize that I'm really turned on when I feel free. So things like this, this, and this really turned me on. And then if your partner seems amenable, you can say, I even had a fantasy of being tied up. It's totally cool if you're not into it, but like, I've just realized that's what it's all about for me. Here's what's cool about this. I have no idea if your partner's interested in being, tying you up or any of the three that you gave them or gave them, but here's what, now they know you deeper. They know what you're sensitive to. They can predict your fantasies and fetishes and way cooler than any of that. The sexiest thing in the world is when someone gives us everything we need in a way we never expected because we can let go of control and get all of our needs met. That's the sexiest thing in the world. So the person knows you better. They can please you better and give you that catharsis. And you don't have to feel ashamed or awkward or rejected when asking for what you need. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, so to, to kind of sum up what, what you're saying here, fetishes and kinks, a lot of us, I think we associate them with being something to be ashamed of and dirty because yeah. the acts in which we think of playing these out have been sort of socially not normalized um, mm -hmm. in, in a yeah. way, or maybe socially shamed. But the truth of the matter is that fetishes and kinks aren't even actually about the act itself. The act itself is about trying to, so fetishes and kinks go back to simply a feeling that we want to feel that we're sensitive to. And it's basically how we play them out in a sexual relationship. Absolutely. So I, I've got a, a more quote unquote perverse one or one that sometimes may shock people a little bit more. And I want to talk about this to, to give this great example. So I had a client recently, I had been working with him for probably six months before he could admit this to me because he had so much shame. But when he was younger, he used to steal his neighbor's underwear and wear it, his straight neighbor's underwear. And this is a gay man. And so um, he's like, Mike, I have so much shame. I'm effed up. I'm wrong. I said, listen, we're not here, obviously, we're not condoning this strategy, but what I want to make it clear is that this strategy was getting a need met. Now, as a young queer boy in the Midwest who didn't know any other queer people and was never validated, it was the only strategy that you knew available to you to feel the power, because he's sensitive to powerful, to feel powerful because this neighbor was athletic he was tall he was strong he was straight he symbolized power in every way to this young queer boy and so i said you know i want to give you a different context here in many cultures across the world wearing the skin or fur of an animal to take on its power has been a ritualistic practice across time and space there's nothing different about this. Now, I'm not saying we condone stealing. Obviously, that's not our, our number one strategy. But when you didn't know any other strategy at the time, you wanted to take on that power and try it on for size because you were smaller, you felt weaker, you were closeted. Well, this person seemed really powerful. That makes sense. There's something inherently logical about that. That is exactly what kinks, fetishes, fantasies are all about. It's simply about that. And it's contextual, you know? In one culture or one time period, it's okay to take on the fur of an animal. But in this case, and granted there is, you know, stealing involved, but in this case, it's so shamed and perverse when actually it's the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we all need to understand is that 
fantasies, kinks, fetishes, these are strategies to get sensitivities met. And your mind is coming up with the best strategies that it knows. And it's amazing because now you can role play. You know, you can be in the middle of sex and have your partner say, imagine if your dad walked in right now, what would he think of you? And you get to work through the shame of that without having to be witnessed by your dad in the sex act. These are amazing abilities. And my advice to everyone listening is at the very least, let yourself go there in fantasy. You do not have to act out anything. You know, Even if your fantasy is, let's say, stealing from somebody else, it's okay to let yourself go there because you're working through the shame associated with it. And I am a huge fan of taking any of your sensitivities, taking the most shameful, quote unquote, shameful fantasies around it and masturbating to them. You want to get more sexually confident. That is the surefire way to do so. And what would you say to people who who are resistant to this, like who are resistant to this idea that they think that doing this is going to lead them down a path where they're, I don't know, going to become this deviant, corrupt person if they if they start l- allowing themselves to have, uh, I don't know, a clear view of what their fetishes and kinks are? Mm-hmm. We are all so afraid of our own power, especially sexual power, right? So this idea that we've got some Pandora's box, and if we just let it open, we're going to lose ourselves, which tells us that we don't actually trust ourselves or trust our own sexuality. I want to talk about the distinction between a sensitivity and a strategy to get it met. There are two very different things, but we don't seem to understand that in our culture. And so we oftentimes will say things, I hear this all the time, right? Like, I have to always be in control because nobody's going to be there to empower me if I'm not. That's a strategy. We have learned, we've been conditioned in our life that we can only feel empowered when we're always in control. Similarly, we may have certain strategies like, you know, I need someone, I don't know, to be in the middle of Bukaki session to feel surrendered, whatever it is, right? That's one way to get there. There might be a number of ways to get there. And at this point in your life, if you're an adult, you've had to find some different strategies. So really think like, what else has made me feel surrendered? And there's tons of ways we can play this game. I'm going to give you an exercise in just a moment. But what I want to say about that is if a strategy ever scares you, first of all, play with it in fantasy to work through because the fear might be the turn on. There are many times with my husband that he will say, you know, I'll vocalize during orgasm and he'll say, Mike, is that true? I say, I have no idea. I was orgasming. Who cares? <laughs> it was just the fear of <laughs> saying it out loud. That's yeah. actually the power. And that's what we, because, you know, you, what you want is a deep catharsis. Most people, compulsions, I, I want to talk about this. Most people who have a compulsion are using a strategy that's not actually meeting their need. And so they have to go back to it and back to it and back to it. It's kind of like, you know, if I am eating food that isn't actually what I want, I just, I'm like, you know, craving more and more because I really want something inside. Like I'm craving a sweetness, but I'm denying myself that. So I'm going to want more and more of it. I have a client that this is a good, good one for you here. So a client, um, this was about a year ago. He had a cruising fetish, complete, was obsessed with it. He was in a monogamous relationship, but he had cheated on his partner a number of times because he could not stop himself. Um, and so he said, Mike, I'm effed up. Something is wrong with me. I don't know what's going on here. And I said, all right, let's go map your sensitivities. Well, wouldn't you know, one of his sensitivities is thrilled. And I said, tell me right now, is sex with your boyfriend thrilling? And he said, no, I know his moves. I know it. I said, okay, we've got, I said, here, would this be thrilling for you? If your boyfriend said, I'm going to send you a package. I'm not telling you what it is. You're going to wait all week. When you get that package, you're going to put it on. It was underwear. You better wear that and have your door unlocked and be ass up in the bed in that underwear and wait for me to come over. Would that? He's like, oh, that would work. I was like, right. That's all that we're saying is you want to feel thrilled. This is the problem is that especially for long-term relationships, what we'll do is we will say, okay, things have gotten stagnant. Things have gotten boring. So what I'm going to do is oftentimes go to porn and get my kind of deeper needs met there because things are boring here. But if I, people will come to me and say, but Mike, I want to make things better in my relationship. We used to love going dancing. So we're going to go dancing again because we want to make things better. Won't that work? No, that will not work. And here's why that won't work. 10 years ago, texting my husband, Garrett, would make me feel vulnerable. 
Mm. Today, that does not make me feel vulnerable. <laughs> the strategy isn't going to work anymore. If I keep doing that strategy, I'm going to get stagnant results. Yep. We want to chase the feeling. We want you to be satisfied. Otherwise, what's going to happen is I'm going to go dancing like that person. I'm going to feel miserable. I'm going to go on porn, look at some quote unquote deviant porn and tell myself that I'm perverse in some way. Yeah. That's what happens to all of us. What we want is to understand why that person couldn't stop cruising is because he wanted to feel thrilled. There are a number, um, by the way, cruising is a fine strategy. If that one works for you, I'm not here to shame it. But there are a number of ways to feel thrilled. What I want you to do is get down to that level. And I promise you, if you feel that in the strategy you're comfortable with, you're not going to need to keep going after other things because what you're getting is the catharsis you're looking for. Mm hmm you know what I find so fascinating about like when when we're talking about this here and this is maybe it's a little bit out there and random and I'm, I'm hoping you can kind of like keep up with where my brain is going <laughs> I'll do it. my best <laughs> so like it's it's almost like remember that time we had the conversation about passion versus purpose yeah it's it's so similar it's because you know when we talk about the things that we do in life in our career and in anything it all goes back to a sensitivity of feeling that we want to fulfill whether we're fulfilling yeah. it in our career whether we're fulfilling it in, and and basically fetishes just go back to that same thing it's a way for us to fulfill those purposes in our life in a sexual way and a more sexually intimate way with the person and so many people, I think, get caught up in, in what you said, these compulsions, because they're focused on the passion versus yes. so the strategy versus being focused on the purpose of it. Like, what am I trying to fulfill here? And then being able to get creative with how we fulfill that need in a way that, that doesn't, I don't know, like if we're in a monogamous relationship, obviously the way we want to fulfill the need of being thrilled is not by going out and having sex with other people, because then I damage right. my monogamous relationship that I want. So how do we meet that need in a way where I don't also damage something in my life that I want to be there? And that's what it's all about. We don't have to, but the more we kind of sexualize it and, and demonize it and cover it up in shame, the less we're able to kind of open it up and look at it and find ways to meet that need in a way that allows for us to not also destroy other areas of our life. You know, I define intimacy as any any strategy that meets both parties' sensitivities. That's it. That's what intimacy is all about. Now, here's the trick, and this is a hard trick for many of us. That strategy may not be meeting the same need for your partner that it is for you, and that's okay. If it works for both of you, great. You know, I have this so often. People will say to me, well, um, here's a great one. <laughs> This changed, this was um, a person who typically tops and this changed his life. He, and I, and I did not even know this was going to change his life. We were going through and we were talking about this and he said he really likes his strategies doggy style. I said, okay, great. And why does he like doggy style? And he said, you know, okay, he wants to feel dominant. Cool. And I said, all right. And this person may feel cared, cared for. And he said, no, 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 they can't feel cared for because I'm in control there. I said, you don't get to decide what they feel. And he said, Mike, I, he said, I have to tell you this. I have never, he's like, I stop myself from doggy style all the time because I think I'm being too selfish. It never occurred to me that they may be feeling something different and that's why it works for both of us. And that's what I want to say to everybody here. You know, hey, your fetishes, your kinks, your fantasies are an amazing starting point because they're telling us what you're sensitive to. And when we can talk to our partners about them and drill down to the academic level, right? That sensitivity level and say, you know, I heard this crazy guy, Mike, and I realized I'm really turned on when I feel connected and thrilled and free. I'm going to give you everybody, you will thank me because anyone who's in a partnership is going to have the best sex of their life tonight. Here's an how do you feel about the fact so that, fun and so easy. How Here's do you feel about the do. fact that thousands yeah. of people are now, thousands of people are now blaming you all around the planet for telling their partners about their, their sexual fantasies? <laughs> Well, I, ideally, it is a uh, good thing if it's getting us to, you know, the place of even better cathartic sex. But yeah, here, you want to get in your partner's head, here's what to do. I just want everyone to ask their partner, you know, during the best sex you've ever had or the hottest video you've ever seen, like, tell me a little bit about it and look for adjectives. Now, if they aren't giving you enough adjectives, you're just going to use the phrase, what was so hot about that? Look for adjectives. It's just a simple way to get started here. 
Now you're going to take, let's say, let's just pretend someone said, um, <clears throat> let's go back to our old friend thrilled. And they said, you know, I oh, know it was really thrilling. Just like not knowing what was going to happen. Okay, cool. Take that word thrilled and say, oh, my partner likes feeling thrilled. Think of three ways to make them feel thrilled. Maybe really simple ways off the top of my head, blindfolding them, um, going up to them, whispering in their ear, you're in for a wild ride and then bringing them close to finishing and stopping and then bringing them close to finishing and stopping like a roller coaster. I guarantee you, they will feel like you just got inside of their head and you're knowing everything that they're secretly feeling that they're ashamed to say, because these are just strategies. And here's the thing. If those ones don't work for you, you can blame me and say, I heard this guy, Mike, he said, you know, he told me this. These are three ways I want to help you feel thrilled. Now your partner gets to say, those didn't work for me, but here are other ways I would feel thrilled. And that's intimacy because you're actually talking about your needs and you know your partner better. Now, you know, when you surprise them with a birthday gift or a gift, they're going to feel great because they feel thrilled. You can know them better. What we want is sex to be about more than just sex. It's about really deeper intimacy. That can be a one-time hookup. That can be a long-term relationship. But we really get to know a person and get to satisfy them on the deepest level possible. And that's what we really want for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. And when we can find those strategies where, like you said, the um, the the client of yours that you had that it was about being dominant. So he liked doing doggy style. And if someone feels like being in the bottom position of doggy style is being cared for, and that's like their fetish, their, their need that they're wanting that when we find those strategies where both people are like, their needs are being met, that's mind blowing sex right there. That's absolutely mind blowing because mind blowing sex is cathartic sex. It's the type of sex that heals us emotionally and releases shame. We are always looking for liberation, which means releasing shame. And so we, what we're really getting to do is feel our sensitivity without shame because that person in, you know, uh, who is bottoming in that situation and feeling cared for, maybe they feel total shame around that. That's how they want to feel cared for. And by working through and allowing that to happen, now they're liberating themselves to feel cared for a thousand different ways. Maybe that's a person who has struggled letting go of control. And so their way of feeling cared for has always been being in control. And this is a place where they're learning how to heal themselves. And so your fantasies, your fetishes, your kinks, I'm going to say this a million times, are your ways to heal yourself. And you know what you're doing. And we can academically understand what you're trying to feel or what's going on. And then we can actually talk to our partners and make sure that we have a strategy that meets both of our sensitivities. Might be different sensitivities, probably is that it's meeting, but any strategy that meets both sensitivities is what we call intimacy. Absolutely. Absolutely. What would you say to people that are afraid to just begin having these sort of conversations with their partners because they've always seen talking about these things as being, um, you know, I think we talked about this before we actually started the call, yeah. people being afraid to talk openly about their fetishes, about their kinks, because they're afraid of A, being sexualized, B, um, feeling shame. Um, and like, how do they begin opening themselves up to being able to start these sort of conversations and being able to feel like they can have it in a way where they're, they're normal. Yeah. Well, you know, lots of ways. So first of all, sensitivity first language is really helpful because it makes it a little bit more academic. So if you say, you know, I heard this crazy guy, Mike, and he made me realize I'm turned on when I feel connected, when I feel wild, when I feel powerful, whatever it is. So it makes sense that I've always been turned on by things like what we've done there because we've inverted the process is it didn't start with a super sexual erotic fantasy. It started with something that was very academic and then it becomes very logical. And, you know, this is how when I do this work um, at a retreat I had recently, it was there was a beautiful moment, beautiful moment where we were in the sauna after a long day of work. Half the people are in Speedos, right? The sauna has a very specific uh, meaning in queer iconography. And um, one of the people is talking about how his partner was um, has a lot of sexual shame and he was going to build a glory hole for him based on the work that we did. And he's going through and describing this glory hole to such extensive detail that it sounded like he was building the most romantic I don't know what for his home like it was so and it was all about well I know this partner's sensitivity so that would work and it would help him be hidden it would like it was all of these pieces to it and one of the other members started crying 
And he said, I've never had an experience like this where I can be around other queer men in a sauna, no less, in the Speedo, no less, having a very sexually explicit conversation and feeling like we can all relate and connect. And these are the only other people in the world who get it. So the fact that most of the time I feel sexualized, I feel judged, I feel ashamed about the things I'm saying in these situations, th because this wasn't about the fantasy. This was about the deeper sensitivities. And so one of my first pieces of advice is to go sensitivity first, really think about what that feeling is and know that, you know, these fantasies, they're just strategies to get there. You know, we can, and we can use it the reverse way. We can watch porn and say, hey, or we can think of um, past sexual experiences and say, hey, that turns me on. What about it turned me on? Or what about that thirst trap turned me on? But then go to the sensitivity level. The second thing I'll say is that talking to our partner is really difficult if we are loaded with shame ourselves around the topic. So masturbate to it. Play with it. Write some erotica to it. I mean, very simple. One of the first things I do with a lot of clients who have shame is have them simply write erotica around their sensitivities and read it out loud and masturbate to it. And especially, you want my pro tip here, through interject some judgments like, holy shit, I can't believe I like this. Or what would this person think if they read this? Allow yourself to work through that shame because what that's going to do is it's going to allow you to just get comfortable and realize, oh, like any logical person would know, you know, if I'm sensitive to seeing, I am going to fetishize voyeurism. That just makes sense. That's not even like difficult for me or desired. Yeah, I want lots of people to desire me. Powerful. Yes, I want to dominate people. Like these things become very logical and there are lots of ways they could manifest, but if we can talk about it from that academic place, it takes a lot of the stigma out of it. And so we really just want our partners to know us better. And if my husband knows that I'm sensitive to successful, sure, give me praise in the bedroom. That's going to work. But I also want someone who's going to be really supportive when I do a great job. And lo and behold, he's sensitive to proud. What a great combination. So we take that synastry, proud and successful, and we learn how to work together with it. Yeah. Absolutely. And definitely, I will say like your pro tip, it, it does work because for me in my 20s, um, I used to actually do this. I had a lot of shame around my sexuality because, you know, the family I, that I grew up in was very, very religious. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I was a kid and I was trying to figure out ways to explore my sexuality because I was terrified of it, you yeah. know, I didn't I didn't really know how to how to even look at it how how could i how could i even express it because like all i knew was that it was wrong it was bad and and so as a young adult when i was in my 20s i did a lot of writing around the things that i i fantasized about and really just was able to kind of get it out on paper and to be it was it was almost cathartic being able to put it into words on paper and being able to sort of like release that out of myself. And, and it was almost like by being removed from it and seeing it on paper, I was like, you know, I don't actually feel as ashamed about this as I thought I would by having it up here. And so, yeah, this was very, very helpful in releasing shame, but also in confidence around sex, because the more I wrote about it, the more I understood what I actually wanted. And the more I was able to express it in a way to people where it wasn't like, you know, oh, well, maybe we want to try this or what do you No, It was like, listen, this is what I want. This is what I like. This is why I like it. Do you, if you're up for doing this, then let's try it. If not, let's talk about, you know, what ways. And it led to my, my sexual confidence, just kind of going through the roof. And, you know, when, before I was married and when I was single, a lot of my sexual partners would always tell me, I wish I was as sexually confident as you. And I'm like, well, just write about what it is that's <laughs> that turns you on, write about it and, and get really comfortable with, with explaining it and like expressing it. And when you write about it, you just become so much more confident and also being able to vocalize it to another person. I love this, Seth. And I'm so, so happy to hear this experience for you because absolutely, you know, we, it is cathartic because we're talking about catharsis here. We're talking about liberation. We're talking about release from shame. When we even put it on page and see it, and then if we want to analyze it, you know, just like my client who's like, no, we had a whiteboard. It's like math class. We can actually analyze and be like, oh, I get what's going on there. You know, 
it's so interesting to me. I have one client who wrote one of these, um, and it was a pretty sadistic fantasy. It was a fantasy where somebody, um, a young intern, basically dominates the boss and makes him have sex over the intercom and humiliates him to the whole, you know, department. And there was a little bit of, you know, violence in it. And I said, it's interesting. This person was sensitive to kind. I said, it's interesting. You're exploring cruelty as a form of kindness because what is more suppressive, this one person or an entire society that wouldn't allow this boss to be his true sexuality? And he's like, and so we're always doing this. We're trying to explore. We're trying to understand ourselves in deeper ways. And speaking out loud. So for me, there's a kind of trajectory here. Can you write it? Or well, first of all, can you even fantasize about it? Letting yourself go there is step number one. But if you can do that, can you write it? Then can you vocalize or speak after the writing? And then finally, actually speaking to another partner. Because what we're always wanting to do, you know, I call vulnerability the transmutation of shame with a witness. Because what we're looking for is every shame we have is culturally contextual. What I mean by that is if you have, let's say, bottom shame, that's because you exist in a culture that, you know, is misogynistic and homophobic and shames, you know, bottoming, right? Because it associates it with more feminine thing. That means that to move through that shame, you have to be cognizant of that context and you have to tell somebody that you like bottoming. And even if you know, even if they're a safe person or that you know they're not going to judge you, you have to project some judgment onto them and just cringe a little bit because when they don't judge you, that's how you move through it. So, and, and by the way, you yourself are one of those people. So when you hear those words out loud, you're like, oh my God, I like this. You're the two parts of you are reckoning with that. There's a part of you like, oh my God, I'm going to judge myself. And there's the other part of you that's like, no, that makes logical sense. Who cares? And that is how we heal ourselves. So what we want to do is begin to, all right, I have one more story for you because I, I think this one's going to drive them some things home here. So I, for anyone who is out there, knows that you have some fantasies or kinks or fetishes, but just feels like you could never talk about them or you're sick, you're effed up, you're broken, whatever those stories are. I hear them all the time. I've got a really important story here. Um, so this was a year ago, I had a client come to me. He was a black gay man. He came to me and he said, Mike, I am so effed up. I'm going to debt over this fetish. I said, okay, well, what's going on? And he said, well, I um, am paying these white, muscly OnlyFans creators inordinate amounts of money to show their hole to me. And I'm going to debt. And I can't stop myself. It's a compulsion. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, I could never tell my partner about this. I'm really effed up. I said, okay, we well, don't want you going to debt, but I promise you there's nothing wrong with you. So let's go map. So we mapped the sensitivities. We did two and a half hours of mapping. And I remember three of the things he was sensitive to were intimate, powerful, and calm. And I said, okay. I said, so... You have a lot of anxiety. Where is it the worst in your life? And he said, how would you know I have a lot of anxiety? He said, you're sensitive to calm. I know that you have anxiety, right? So where is it the worst? He said, okay, it's the worst at work. And he said, is that because you have a big team? You feel like you're just a number. You don't feel enough support. And so that is true. How would you know that? I said, because intimate. We can see it here. If you felt intimate, you would be feeling calm. So we know that it's not feeling intimate enough. I said, okay, great. All right. So you're going home. You're masturbating to porn. You know, we've got powerful, we've got intimate. This makes sense here. And I said, here, tell me this. You know, you've told me that you see these people. They've got tons of followers on Instagram. These guys are showing you the whole, they're the pinnacle of gay culture in your opinion. I said, you know, as a black gay man, do you feel powerful every day of your life? How often do you feel powerful? And he said, I don't feel powerful. I don't feel powerful at work. I don't feel powerful in my life. I don't feel powerful in sex. I said, okay. <laughs> this one's easy for us to analyze here. Okay. You don't feel powerful. After a long day of work, when you have tons of anxiety, you've on this big team, you don't feel powerful. Do you think it would be appealing that with a click of a button, you can have the people whom you consider the most powerful people in your community to be vulnerable to you when you have power of them with the click of one button? It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not fucked up. So you're not fucked up. There's nothing wrong. This is actually very logical. But here's the thing. I don't want you going into debt. So this is a strategy. Let's find a new strategy and one that maybe even includes your partner so that you can feel intimate and calm and powerful in ways that feel good to you and don't put you into debt. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. This is, I mean, it's, a, I mean, we're talking about this in a very sexual way, but this ties into so much of also what I'm, what I'm teaching my clients when I talk about, you know, authenticity, purpose in life and, 
just how to meet needs in a way, you know, like, cause it, this doesn't just apply to sex. This also applies to habits that we have with, with overeating, over drinking, mm -hmm. over anything. Yes, that's right. It's, and people feel so much shame around these behaviors because they identify the the behavior as being this deviant thing and it's their identity. And I'm just like, no, this behavior is a strategy. This behavior is you trying to meet a need. So let's figure out what that need is so we can meet it in a way that doesn't stop you from creating the life, the whole package that you want. And this is where people, I think, start to get the idea that there's something broken about them. There's something so wrong with them is because the strategy is destroying parts of their life yeah. that they want to be held together, such as this man going into debt. I'm sure one of the things that he wants in life is a life where he is financially also powerful of and course. free. Yes. If he's going into debt over this, well, then he's like, okay, so this, this behavior over here is ruining this thing that I want in my life. What is so wrong with me that I can't stop doing this? Yep. And I, I feel like being able to just show people that this all goes back to a very, a very human need. It's a very basic yeah. human normal need. And this is just one way you're expressing it. Being able to talk about it this way and understand that, and then branch it out into every other area of life, including sex, is, I think, one of the best things we can do for ourselves in liberating ourselves in every way in life, including with sex. But I think sex is one of those, I guess, Wild West territories that we keep resisting bringing this into because we have so much programming around sex being this very kind of dirty thing. And I, I you know, to, to pinpoint where exactly this comes from is a bit difficult. I mean, I, I feel like Puritanism in the US was one of the biggest ones, but I mean, there are so many different areas in life where, where I think this sexual shame comes from. And I really feel like I, I want to see in my lifetime, uh, a lot of the sexual shame just being dropped and people being able to have these conversations and people being able to sit in a sauna in a speedo and cry because someone's talking about building a glory hole for their partner and be like, oh my God, that's the most romantic thing I've ever heard in my life. And I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> So, and, and so many people would be like, no, that's not romantic. That's disgusting. That's dirty. And I'm like, no, it's, this person is, is getting needs met and they're building intimacy with their partner and they're yeah. finding ways to do it in a way that works for both of them. That's beautiful. You know, for, when it comes to kings and fetishes, uh, one of my closing thoughts here is I had a friend once who um, she was really addicted to sugar and she had so much shame about this. She was hiding sugar. She was eating it in the bathroom. I mean, she just had lots and lots of shame. And so she decided that she was going to quit sugar once and for all. But the strategy she decided was she was going to let herself for two weeks eat as much sugar as she wanted, like gross amount. She was going to feel sick from it. And then she was going to stop eating it. And she said she even overdid it. She even had more sugar than she wanted at moments. By the end of those two weeks, she never wanted sugar again because she felt liberated to eat it whenever she wanted. And she was kind of like, but I don't actually want it that much. It was just the shame. It was me stopping myself that made it so appealing to me. You know, when it comes to kinks and fetishes, if we've never allowed ourselves to feel these sensitivities in bed, and this is the one way we know how to do it, then when masturbating, when watching porn, we have that moment of complete liberation because we finally let ourselves have it. And then what happens after we orgasm? We feel shame. We feel embarrassed. We judge ourselves. We, you know, we feel like we can never tell anybody about this. If anybody ever saw our incognito window, God forbid, you know, like that all comes up and it's about liberation. We're seeking liberation in that moment. And this is a strategy that liberates us. Now, it's not the only strategy in the world, but it's a strategy. And it's okay to explore that if our partner is interested or whether, I mean, long-term partner or our partner that night is interested or our fantasy, we want to play with it ourselves, we're interested in, go for it. And if they're not interested, that's okay. We can academically analyze it and figure out what it's about and find a strategy that works for them too. And that's awesome. That's all we're talking about here. I always say never, ever, ever waste an orgasm. We want to have mind-blowing sex every time. And the way we have mind-blowing sex every time is when our deepest buttons are hit, right? That deep itch is scratched every time because emotionally we know what that is. And a lot of times it doesn't take a lot of work. It can be connected. Oh, let me add eye contact. Let me add holding hands during sex. That's going to change everything for me. Or it's thrilled. Let me start and stop a lot of time. 
or it is, you know, vulnerable. Let me um, be able to vocalize any shame. Like we don't, it doesn't have to be a super kinky, complicated thing. It can be, which is amazing, but it also can just be simple. And so allow yourself to play on that level. And I guarantee it will change your sex life. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. This is something that, that, you know, me and, and my husband, we purposefully started in the beginning of our relationship talking about is we talked about in our past relationships, how we felt sexually repressed ourselves in the past relationships and why. And it turns out it was because we weren't showing up in those relationships always and telling our partners, you know, the things that we wanted and how to meet those needs. It was because we were afraid and ashamed of talking about them. Yeah. And so we made a promise in the beginning of our relationship to our with with each other that we would openly communicate things that turn us on, things that we want to try. It didn't matter what it was. And even if the other person didn't want to do it, that's okay. We can get to the bottom of it and figure out another avenue to explore this yes. where we're both comfortable with it. And so I, I feel like this is one of the best things that we did for our relationship in the beginning was setting ourselves up for that instead of these relationships where it's about hiding when it comes to sex mm -hmm. and shame and leading to all of this, you know, almost what you call compulsive behaviors that you're doing like yes. in the dark, in the closet, hiding from people. And, and it's, it's something that we can really just start to open up and, and feel free about if we, you know, bring other people in and, we uh, allow ourselves to, well, like you said, allow ourselves, first of all, to see that it's not something that we have to feel ashamed about and then bring other people in, our partners especially, to be able to talk about this in a way where they are also in on the conversation and then it becomes almost like a mutual journey. Let's explore, like, you know, if we spent our lifetime right now exploring all of the different strategies that we could try with sex to to meet these sensitivities i wonder how many strategies we could we could discover in our lifetime i mean it makes sex exciting like mm -hmm. i'm sure there are millions hundreds thousands of them out there and we're just like not even trying it because we're not talking to our partners about it and then we wonder why our sex lives are stagnant and you know when our partners know those sensitivities or know us that deeply I can't tell you how many times I have told my husband something and felt so ashamed and thought he would definitely judge me. And he's like, yeah, duh. But that's a really logical one with these sensitivities. I already knew that. So what we want is our partners to know us that deeply. And, you know, a, a final thought I have here, just because this one excites people sometimes. So I want to share this is you mentioned earlier, Seth, how much, how sexually confident this makes you. And I want all of us to feel sexually confident. And these aren't just you know, these kinks and fetishes also explain to us sexual superpowers or where people um, defer to us because they can feel the kind of sexual authority we have there. And so same scene client, I'll bring him back one more time, who had all the shame about the voyeurism while he was having sex with a partner who wasn't able to orgasm. And he said to me, Mike, I don't know what to do. He's not finishing. Is there something I can do? So yeah watch this. You're going to seem like a sex guy. This is really fun. So you're sensitive to scene. The next time that you have sex with him, here's what I want you to do. When you're getting close and you, you can feel like he's getting close and he can't give himself permission, I want you to get, be on top of him and look him deep in the eyes. And I want you to say, look me in the eyes. Look me in the eyes and don't look away for a second. I can see everything about you. I can see all of your desires and you want to come right now. So I guarantee you he will. And he did. And he and and he was like, Mike, I feel like, you know, people are going to think I'm the sex guy. I said, right, because he knows you can see him when you're on dates, when you're everywhere. He can feel how much you see him fully. He's already, you know, believing you more because it's true for you. All you're doing is giving him, and it's true. He does want to orgasm. He can't give himself permission. So you're helping him by seeing that desire inside of him. And that's true for all of us. You know, if you're sensitive to vulnerable, you can help people go to vulnerable depths they never could. Connected, they can go to connected depth. You know, what we're really doing here is just allowing ourselves to be fully present. And to be honest with you, this isn't just about sexuality anymore. This is spiritual. We're yeah. talking about a real spiritual catharsis and showing up fully in life. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like, to me, that seems so obvious that sex is a very spiritual act because it's one of the most, I mean, intimacy is spirituality, being present, fully present with another person in any context, including sex is very spiritual. And um, I, I wish that more people could see that because I feel like, as I said, we've all been sort of programmed to, to see sex as this 
hidden thing that we're, you know, actually a lot of people think it's very anti-spiritual and I'm like, no, 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 no. You're missing out mm -hmm. on so much about sex. If you're, you're separating the two, they're very much in the same Avenue. So closing thoughts. I know we've, we've been talking for quite a while here and you need to get on with your day. So um, what, what would your closing thoughts be for people um, and also how can people get a hold of you? Because I'm sure some people are going to listen to this episode and be like, Hey, I want to join in one of these workshops. I want to see what I can get out of this too. Maybe some people are doubting whether or not their, their fetishes or kinks are actually normal. And they're like, maybe mm -hmm. if I join one of these workshops, I can find out. What do you have to say? Absolutely. That? So uh, closing thoughts, you know, I've given a lot so far, but I, I think my, my overarching message is just that you are right. Everything about you is right and logical and makes sense. And we can actually just go and analyze these things and understand who you are. Because what we want more than mind-blowing sex, and believe me, we want that, more than liberation, and believe me, we want that too, is we want you to know who you are and fall in love with yourself and be able to share that with the world and let other people fall in love with you. And so um, that's what we're doing here. When we're able to get to the root of what our kinks and fetishes are, we're able to share with partners, friends, ourselves, who we really are. They're teaching us who we are and we can fall in love deeper and realize the same reason I fetishize this thing over here is why it makes me a good friend. It's what makes me you know, a good business. It's all of them are the same thing because it's who we are in the world. And if you ever are interested in following me, um, Seth mentioned I'm on Instagram. You're welcome to follow me there. I try to give tips and advice and lots of things, especially related to GBTQ plus men. Um, I, of course, do mapping, you know, two and a half hour sessions. So if you actually want to go in and get your sensitivities mapped, I do that in group or one on one. And then I do these new monthly workshops um, on a variety of topics from dating and flirting, you know, your signature flirting style to kinks and fetishes to Re reigniting the spark and long-term relationships, et cetera. Um, and those you'll find out about on Instagram. So come follow me at Mike Iamelli. Perfect. And I'll link that also in the show notes. So if you um, didn't get that, I'll have a, have his social media linked in the show notes. You can just go there, kind of click on it and head to his social media page. He's got a lot of really cool stuff on Instagram. So definitely go check it out. Even if you don't want to go to one of the workshops, just go check out his content because it's really cool. So I appreciate it. I appreciate seeing it in my feed every day when I'm scrolling through. All right. So Mike, I'm going to let you go so that uh, you can get on with your day. It was a pleasure having you on again for the fourth time now. I'm sure we'll have you on again. And yeah, for everyone else, you all have a wonderful end to your week and I'll see you all again here next week. Ciao. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode. That call was so much fun to have with Mike. So glad to have him back on the podcast for a fourth time, and I'm sure we will see him again. So for any of you all that listened into this episode that really resonated with the message here, I just want to encourage you to reach out because sexual shame is not something to joke around about. It's not something that only affects your sex life. It can affect your ability to be intimate with yourself. And I'm not even talking about sexually intimate with yourself, your ability to even be able to open up with yourself and know yourself truly to be able to create a life that is authentically fulfilling for you. So I just want to encourage anyone who listened into this episode that is feeling like this spoke to you, like this is something that you've been battling and struggling with, I want you to reach out. Um, Mike or I both are here to help anyone who might be struggling with, with understanding their truest and most authentic self and showing up in their life in a way where they are creating exactly what they want to be able to create in their life and knowing what that is with a clear vision and being able to be with our most intimate parts, the parts that we have been maybe socially programmed to feel the most shame around, being able to open those up and see them for truly what they are and what is behind them is the secret sauce to being able to live the life this way. So I would say if you're looking for more of a workshop type setting where you're working with someone and a group of other people who want to release sexual shame, Mike is the guy to go to. If you're looking at applying this out into the rest of your life and how it is that you want to show up in your life in the most authentic version of yourself without being ashamed of, of the parts that maybe you've had some social programming around that has told you, hey, this is something to be ashamed of and hide then I'm here for you for some one-on-one some -on -one coaching, 
so we can work together. Mike is also available for, for mapping out your sensitivities for you if that's something that you're interested in. But I just want to encourage anyone who listens to this episode that feels like this resonated with you and like this is something you don't want to sit around on anymore. Reach out. Get the help. That's what we're here for. All right. I love you all so much. And I'll talk to you all again next week. Ciao. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the content of this podcast. If you did, please subscribe so that you're one of the first people to know when I release a new episode each week. If you have any questions or if you have interest in learning more about the coaching that I do with my clients one-on-one, then just head over to my website at www.lifecoachseth.com. That's www.lifecoachseth.com. There you're going to have the ability to reach out to me for questions that you might have or to book your free discovery call with me to discuss what one-on-one coaching with me might be like for you. You can also check out and order your copy of my book to get a taste of what I'm all about as a person and as a coach. I'm so happy that you joined us today and I hope to have you here again next week. So until then, let authenticity be the guide to your most unstoppable and fulfilling journey of life.